Hi, I'm Chris Dawuski, and I am the founder and creator of My Pomerania. And today, I just I want to give you a quick overview about who we are and and what we do. Now, like I said, my name is Dawuski. I am the last. Uh, my brother and I are the last of our family surname. So for me, that's it's really a big part of what got me into this. The question of who are we? Uh, you know, I'd ask my grandpa growing up, like, what does the name Dawuski mean? Can you tell me anything about your family? And uh, there were never a lot of answers. He, his sister knew all the information, and sadly she had passed away before I was born, so I had no one really to ask about these things. So I became interested in my family history pretty early in the game, but had no tools to do anything about it. So when I studied abroad in 2014, I was able to meet my grandfather's 96-year-old cousin, who had fought in World War II, who, who was born in 1918, who was able to tell me all of the stories and the things that he remembered from our family's home village. So for me, a large part of that was opened up because I was able to connect with a living relative in Germany at the time, and it forever changed my life. I founded My Pomerania in 2015. This was before I became editor of Die Pomerian Leute. I did that for about two years, and then I I had left to mostly focus on my Pomerania. My goal has been to essentially help people find their family history without having it be tied to sources of revenue. It, it's For me, it's not about money. It's not about trying to get a subscriber base. It's about trying to get what is realistically public information out into the hands of the public and to set it free and to, to empower people to find their family history without having to pay anything for it. I have a master's in educational technology and a bachelor's degree in visual arts education. I, I've worked in teaching for eight years now. Um, so I suppose a lot of what I do with my Pomerania is also influenced by my um, technical background in that. You know, I, I'm a freelance web designer. Um, so combining art with, with my love of teaching, is, it's just a different platform to do that. And like I mentioned, my brother and I are the last of our family surname. So for me, a lot of this is not just to preserve my own family history, but to recognize that there are people like me whose family trees look like a bolt of lightning struck it. And, you know, it's just straight down the tree and that's that's it. What do people like me have, have to do, especially when you look far enough back and some of the people aren't, um, you know, they're not landowners, they're not, you know, there's no civil records in the area. What do you do? So... Um, for me, a lot of that was finding those alternatives and providing hope to people that maybe at some point they could find answers to their you know, hundred-year-old family mystery. Now, my own knowledge of my German culture goes way back to when I was about two years old. In fact, this is probably one of my earliest memories. Um, I remember going to Oktoberfest in Stillwater, Minnesota with my grandfather. Uh, it's the guy you're seeing there holding me. I'm about two years old in this picture. Um, and in fact, Carl, the, the cousin that I was talking about, he's the one who took this picture. For me, I mean, a large part of my interest in my German heritage was not knowing much about it at all. I mean, sure, my grandpa would talk a little bit about his dad here and there. We'd talk about, uh, you know, what it is to be German. There's Oktoberfest, there's going to the Gusthaus. Unfortunately, for a lot of uh, descendants of immigrants uh, to America, um, after several generations, we don't have a large pull back to who we were and what that was really like. Uh, and I know in, in Germany today and in a lot of places in Europe, you know, people see themselves as European. For a lot of us, we're hungering to, to find exactly what part of Germany it was. It's not even just, you know, we're German, but to, to go back and actually find the information that most Germans are familiar with. You know, they've grown up with it. They know their villages and they know the family the traditions and things like that. We, we by and large, kind of lost generations of this. I was lucky enough to know enough information to be able to preserve this for my family, but had it gone another generation beyond, I don't know what would have been left to preserve. So just putting that in context for a lot of Americans, finding and having living relatives that can actually tell us about that story is what, what really makes it important. My grandfather's cousin with me and my wife in the top picture there, um, I got to speak with him in 2014. We interviewed extensively and talked about and recorded the family history. He had been searching for a lot of the information for well over 50 years. So he was able to show me, you know, his first driver's license, pictures of his home village in Klein Rambin in Christ Belgard. The lower picture, he's, he's the older of the, the boys that you see in the picture there, uh, in his father's house. These are all pictures I had never seen before. These are not things that we had saved in America or even had copies of. And he was worried that, you know, I'm 96 years old. I'm going to die soon. I don't know when. I don't want all of my stuff to just get tossed out. Like, this is family history. This is important. This slide here, you're seeing pictures that we did have in America, you know, like the house in Ruzzo in Christ Kohlberg, Corlin, you know, and, so, and some of the children, but nothing's labeled. We really don't have a reference or time frame. Uh, the guy standing in the middle of the picture, I had assumed, might have been my great-great-grandfather, and that really wasn't the case. It was a neighbor. 
um, the guy holding things. It turned out that was my great-grandfather. It wasn't a brother. It was him. That was his house. Uh, that's the one that they lived in. And he was telling me all about, you know, like even what he was holding. Those are beets, you know. They're, so what they farmed, context of that, he was able to tell me who some of the people in the pictures were. Uh, and down on the bottom, you see my great-grandfather. Um, and then you see a picture of my great-grandfather and my grandfather along with his cousin Carl. And then, you know, my grandfather and my father, and then me and my father, it, passing down the lineage of specifically for me and, and one of the most important parts of my search what does the name Dewoski mean? Because there's only two of us left that are going to bear this name in the future. I'm happy with the progress we've made as a collective uh, for, for Pomeranian history, but I know that we have so much further to go. Um, I see the room that we have an opportunity to continually improve how we access, share, preserve our family history, and, and share all of this with other people. Because if, if we don't do it now, I, my fear is, you know, there's a fire in Krakow a couple of years ago, and, and a lot of the archives holdings disappeared. There's wars breaking out all over the world. And take the Hiras Archive in, in Potsdam, for example. It's a lot of stuff that, you know, maybe 100 years ago people wouldn't have thought would disappear like that. We've got aging documents. We have things that are just making it impossible. And we've never had an easier time digitizing and making stuff available. So for a, a lot of what I see, I see an opportunity to preserve and then to make it accessible. And that's a little bit about what... Uh, I'm trying to do with my website. So if I would have known then what I know now, I would have called it our Pomerania. Make no mistake, there's nothing mine about it. It's sure technically it's my website I run it, but it all of the resources on there, all of the scans, they're for everyone. And it, a large part of the philosophy, I guess I borrow from the, the head of the archive resources collection in Gorjo. You know, your records and this and this and this. And he looked at me and he said, these aren't my records. These are your records. They're for everyone. They're paid for with Polish tax dollars to, to keep and preserve them. There's nothing mine. It's anybody in the world wants these. And then he gave me permission and tried to convince me. He's like, you know, you should write a book about this. You could lead tours here. You could generate a little bit of money. I'm like, I don't care about the money. It's not about money. I just, I want to get this information out there for everybody. Uh, and so it was kind of with his blessing that I, I started doing a lot more with what I was doing. Uh, by uploading records to a portal on Google Drive, which is a, a very cheap platform. It has a, um, it has the ability to preview the images and tab and things like that. So, again, started in 2015 as a hobby site. Um, in 2017, I was gifted thousands of scans from, I want to say, 50 or 60 different books, mostly from Stolp, from a fellow researcher who had gone there. And she said, you know, if I can help other people too, I'd, I'd love to do this. So that's kind of how the, the portal got seeded. In 2018, I, I started paying for a few books that I was interested in on Upwork. I sourced it using my own finances. And then in 2019, I, I went to Koshalin, Szczecin, and Gorzo and photographed over 300 archival documents and put those online for free for everybody. Prior, I had tried uh, asking people, I was like, you know, if you have anything, and everybody thought that it was a money-making venture at the time. You know, if you have nothing, why would you want us to do this for you? And, you know, kind of questioning my intent with it, well... I put my money where my mouth was. I went broad. I did what I needed to do. Uh, and it slowly grew over, over that time. And it wasn't until about 2021 um, when I had, had found a few photographers in Poland who, who were willing to help me out at the archives. They, they really liked the mission that we had. Um, and we're also looking for a little bit of side income. So, you know, I started contracting with local, local photographers, um, mostly in Koshalin at the time. And then, uh, you know, articulating agreements to go to Szczecin and get uh, immigration records that, that could link people to their family history. So I'm continually asking readers, you know, if you have scans, this is the most valuable resource. If you've already paid for something um, or if you've gone and taken pictures yourself, you know, consider gifting us a copy of them that we can share um, with, with no terms, no agreements. Just anybody who wants them can, can download, share, upload, put it up on their own website so that we'll never have to pay for them again and so that these records don't disappear from the historical record. Uh, and uh, Just to make sure everybody's clear, my website is free and always will be because, honestly, I don't agree with the, the philosophy that somebody's family history should be locked behind a paywall. I understand people need to work and people need to eat, but at the same time, you know, that's not the focus of our website. It's, it's, my Pomerini is not about generating income. It's about generating records and making sure that those records are out there for everybody. I, I disagree fundamentally with, you know, you have to pay $100 or, you know, close to $200 for some European sites for six months of access to, to documents that are realistically and in many regards public record. So just 
really trying to hammer that out here. It's always free. Uh, and it's a little bit of a joke. Some people that I had met abroad were like, you can't just do that. You can't just offer things for free. I'm like, well, you want me to do double my prices? You know, tw- double nothing is still nothing. Um, the the intent is, is very much, you know, kind of the why of my Pomerania. You see me and my cousin over there, my grandfather's cousin, who, again, at the time was 96 years old. Seeing him, for me, was a huge highlight. For him, seeing me, seeing a living relative, and seeing that people still cared about him, kind of personal and kind of sad, but, you know, he was living alone. His only friend that really came by was the neighbor lady, and um, my understanding is that he's not alone in that. So connecting to family, connecting to who we were. And, you know, the last two years of his, his life, we continued writing. I went back and I visited him several more times uh, while studying abroad, and then one more time in the summer before he passed away. And uh, it, it was a life-changing experience, I think, for both of us. So the why, the, the why is clear. I mean, it's for making connections between living family. It's, it's about making connections to things that may be lost forever that are somehow preserved. Um, it's in the large part, it's it's about making connections to who we are hundreds of years back and realizing how connected we all are. Uh, so for those who are in a position to share records, and I, I understand there are some uh, contracts and agreements that, that keep perhaps an organization or, or some people who have worked with the archives from doing this, but if there are no contracts and no agreements, um, and you, you've done this independently, if you can share, this is how your effort helps. It saves wasted energy duplicating work. It saves people from having to pay to have stuff duplicated twice. My philosophy was always records that are sitting on someone's hard drive aren't doing anyone any good, especially if no one knows that they're there. I mean, at bare minimum, put it out there that you have these and are willing to help people, uh, and at best case, set it free. T- take the records, set them free. Let people be able to share them between themselves. Um, it provides hope. I mean, my cousin had searched for these answers for 50 years, and I found them in a matter of maybe six months for, for some of the answers. We still haven't found all of them. But, you know, it's, it's about helping Grandpa, for example, find answers that he spent his whole life wondering before he passes away. It's about raising awareness for commonly overlooked sources, you know, people who give up um, because, you know, the civil records don't exist anymore. Well, that's okay. If they owned a farm, there's land records that might even have their birthday and their father and their grandfather. Um, it's about preserving history. So for some, we're not that last generation who can articulate the history before it's gone. To, to make sure that it's saved somewhere. And even if you can't find that answer, maybe someone else can because of the work that we're sharing between ourselves. Um, it's about decentralizing information. It makes it less likely for something that is destroyed in a physical archive to go lost forever. It's, it's less likely that if the website that originally had these scans goes dark, well, if that goes dark and it disappears forever, what do you do? This makes sure that hopefully there are multiple copies out there that ensures record survival in the long term. And physical buildings are, are not the way of the future. It's, it's the way that technology is moving. You know, we're slow to catch up to it, but I truly believe 100 years from now, most of our records will be kept digitally, uh, even if there were physical copies at one point. How do we decentralize that so that, you know, something doesn't happen that makes them disappear forever? Um, The focus of the website, free and open access to historical records. It's also to have helpful guides for English-speaking audiences. Uh, I I don't hold back on that. This is kind of a point I want people to know is that There are so many resources out there in German. Uh, There are some out there in Polish, but for the English-speaking audience, unless you're buying a physical book that was written more than 20 years ago, there's not a lot out there. And there's more coming online um, since I started the website, which I'm I'm very grateful for. There's Google Translate, which has been fundamental in being able to understand the resources that are out there, uh, especially with the way that it's it's improved substantially. Um, But to provide help to those of us who don't know half of what is out there to even look for. I mean, you're hopping sometimes two different language barriers. You're translating from a Polish website into German and from German back into English in the context that gets lost in that, I, I, especially with the population here in America that is predominantly interested in pursuing this stuff. We're talking about an older audience who's not as tech savvy. They didn't go to school for technology like what I did. And it makes it rather difficult. So my goal and my hope is to help break these things down. Searchable databases, and these are still, I would say, kind of in beta. They're not as complete as what I'd like them to be, and I hope to change that in time. But I do have a small database of index records that 
myself and a few others have helped with. Um, there's a, a, a part of the site for family trees that can be uploaded. Um, so if you have a specific small part of it that you want to look for and you want other people to be able to see, you can upload it there. Um, and this was generated in part by my work with De Pommersen Leute uh, in California. Um, they had have tens of thousands of, of uh, essentially people in pedigrees on family trees, and they're, they're sitting on the shelf. There's nothing digitized. There's nothing that was put in. So I, I created that at the time as, as kind of a, an encouragement to them to, um, if there was an interest, be able to have that or a version of that for their site or to combine our efforts uh, but nothing ever came out of that. That was right around the time that I had exited being editor for Deep Hummers and Loita uh, to focus on doing stuff more for free. Um, on my website, there's also a master inventory of what's been digitized and what's available. And this has, I think, presently about five, uh, sorry, 800 different records. And if you click on a button that says View Book, I'll, I'll show you guys a video of that in a few minutes. Um, and then it also presents an opportunity to collaborate, so not just what's available for mine, but kind of a, a library, if you will, uh, a library tab where we can uh, share what we have within our individual groups. Uh, I've worked with the uh, publisher for Ein Freistadt in Wisconsin um, out of Mequon, and they, they were uh, really helpful in that. They, they contributed their entire stock, their catalog. Um, and then I'm working with the Pummerin Regional Group in Minnesota, to hopefully do the same thing. So we have not just one searchable list for each of our websites separately, but we have one giant concatenated list of who has what book, who has, um, you know, maybe a single print copy of something that doesn't exist anywhere else. Who can we contact? Because it's not about just amassing as much as we can for one website. Again, it's about decentralizing it and making it as accessible to everyone as possible. Uh, the focus of my Pomerania specifically, in terms of our record portal, is secondary sources. Uh, I'm sure there are some church books, there are some civil records that, that I've worked to digitize uh, that haven't been in the public purview before, but for the most part, it's land records, uh, Grundbucher, uh, Grundakten, Riesesakten, uh, Erkundensammlungen, and Reinkarten, so things that would have... Uh, genealogical value uh, and off to the left you see a page of a Grinbucher that has you know essentially the entire family the uh, mother and father and all the children and their birth dates um, which if civil records don't exist in the area this is huge um, immigration records so filling in gaps for people who are possibly not landed so day laborers shepherds herdsmen wanderers and that that is one of the hardest parts of what i'm trying to do is to fill in gaps for people who essentially had very few records kept about them other than their civil records which in many places don't exist anymore so trying in large part to find those wandering populations to answer the questions for people who are like well you know who are we did we did we was a common laborer what what history is there for this person? Well, I'm going to keep looking. That's that's a large part of the goal of this. And then guild records, um, because those do help, depending on the type of record it is, those have helped people at least connect to a, sp a specific place or maybe to find one other relative that then if they go to the civil records, they're able to look through and, and find what more might be available. My large focus on this is decimated areas without church or civil records. So places that Maybe there's a church book missing, so before 1874, or maybe it's there's a lot of stuff before 1874 and there's nothing after it. The, the Stanisamt is, is completely destroyed. Trying to find those pockets of where records are missing and be able to digitize those. And again, specific focus on Polish archives uh, in the areas of Pomerania, Neumark, Posen, uh, mostly just because of my familiarity with it, but I've got more contacts there. That's where I traveled specifically myself and I, I had that permission to be able to put stuff online to publish so I would love to expand these efforts to places like Greifswald um, you know the Brandenburg Landeshauptarchiv especially with their immigration collection uh, in the the Prussian secret state archives uh, places like that that have fundamentally hugely important records that perhaps people in Germany are, are very familiar with and for them it's like well yeah just go to this archive and, and but for us you know we're thousands and thousands of miles away we, we can't access that so I mean we'd love to expand 
efforts there if if we're able to and if the law allows for it. Um, again, the big why, well, aging documents, destruction, fires, wars, things that keep records from uh, being available permanently. Um, and then time is another factor. You know, last of the living people that can actually tell you about the family history, the last of the living people that these, these records will actually have some meaning beyond what somebody just pulling them out 50 years from now will be able to look at and see. Time, because digitization is slow and everybody who chips in a little bit helps with the larger picture of it. And it, it's also a venue, again, to help reconnect with, reconnect the living with their heritage. And I, I understand that recent European laws have kind of complicated this process. So a part of my website allows the living, those who, who can tell a little bit about their family, to kind of put out a bulletin. You know, this is what I'm looking for. This is who I'm looking for. If anybody's interested, please contact me because a lot of us don't understand or even know the European laws. And for those of us that do, it's um, the privacy laws in the last five or six years have, have complicated processes for those of us over here in America um, and in Brazil and in New Zealand and in places that outside of, of the EU uh, to, to try to even be able to find what we're looking for. And with that, you know, I, I want to be as respectful as possible with it, but at the same time, kind of put it out there that there are those of us that are looking. And if my website can, can help empower people to at least put out a message saying, hey, we're looking for this and this and this, and somebody over there might be searching for it and find it, you know, that's that's a major win. That's a major victory. And descendants of immigrants want to find their living relatives. We, you, this is, you know, for, for some of us, it's the fourth or fifth or sixth generation. I'm a fourth generation. My great-grandfather's the one who immigrated here. So there are people who, who don't remember that story, who are looking for an opportunity to find whatever they can, um, find whoever they can, and, and understand more about it than they're just German. You know, where did they come from? So offering, uh, offering an opportunity in the hopes that somebody will contact them. And uh, again, bringing it back to the opportunity to preserve and share family documents, my cousin Carl Heinz, he, he helped me ship 18 boxes back to the United States. Um, his daughter was basically going to, to uh, throw it all out in the trash when he died or sell it. So he said, you know, all of this has meaning. We need to make sure that this goes back to America with you. You're, it needs to stay in the Dwoski family. So we shipped 17 boxes, mostly of photographs. And the first time I was there, you know, we brought back like two extra suitcases of family albums too, of all these things I've worked hard over the years to digitize and make sure that everyone in the family has a copy of um, to preserve it. Uh, other best example is the Zabersky family, related through me, through the Ehlert family of Rarfen in Belgard. Uh, I, I was really sad to find out through an online forum uh, that somebody had, had found a book at a flea market. Um, I mean, I'd followed his website, which is no longer online. His books, his photo albums, all of the work that he had spent his life on to preserve his family history wound up at a flea market. Um, so, again, the focus of the website is to, to prevent the stuff from destroying family histories forever and to provide another alternative. And in the future... Um, main plans that I hope to accomplish. We're very close and on schedule to finish digitizing the most obvious collections for immigration records in Szczecin. Um, I think we might have another 50 or 60 books to go, but the vast majority of them have been digitized or in the process of it and will be put online for free for everybody. I'll continue to digitize land and guild records as, as we can, especially in pockets where no other records exist. And looking to partner with more groups to add to the master collection of, of books owned and digitized and to collect with, uh, connect with people who are in, in different groups and resources. So um, specifically, uh, I guess two different focuses on that would be, one, if you have records you're willing or able to contribute, we'd love to put them on ours. And by the way, feel free, any of the records that we have on ours, there's no copyright. It's it's open source. I'll, I'll share about that in a minute. But all of that, download it, put it on a hard drive, share it, make sure that it, it doesn't ever get lost again. And the second focus being um, connecting people to different groups. So again, with the idea of if one group has this book, but only that group knows that they have the book, it doesn't do anybody any good. So to connect people to these groups and these resources is, is a huge thing. Uh, and like I said, open source genealogy, everything, uh, all the records that are up on my website as far as as far as I can, open source, you know, share, uh, redistribute, you know, please don't put them up for sale, but like just make it available. Put it on a hard drive, put it on your own website. It, for me, trying to keep this going is is the purpose of it, so...
And for books that are already in the public domain, this is not a difficult concept. It's not something new. It's, uh, I mean, the hardest part is getting it digitized um, and having the means to share it. But if you can, the question should not be if this is what we're doing. It, the question should be what's the best way to do it? How do we go about doing this? And how can we work as groups around the world to, to meet the same goals out of this? And I just I want to finish this by saying thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you guys today and, and share a little bit about what we do at my Pomerania. Um, I wish I would have been able to speak here in person. I appreciate the ability to, to do it this way as well. So if there are any questions, people want to get in touch with me, you know, feel free to contact me at the, the contact information up here. More than willing to, to continue the conversation on this and build partnerships with you guys. So thank you so much.